Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's EGU panel discussion on the Science Policy Pairing Scheme. My name is Elias Grampas, and I am managing the European Parliament Intergroup on Climate Change, Biodiversity and Sustainable Development. And I am uh, delighted to be hosting this discussion on the Science Policy Pairing Scheme within the next uh, 45 minutes or so. Uh, before we kick off, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank uh, EGU and specifically Chloe for taking the lead with regards to the organization of this session enabling for us all to be together virtually, well, for 2021. Um, so a little bit about the Intergroup, uh, which is a platform for the European Parliament, uh, bringing together MEPs, so members of the European Parliament, from all political groups and parliamentary committees to find sustainable solutions to some of the greatest challenges of our times. Uh, this balanced uh, forum for discussion, at the same time, allows for policymakers to listen, debate, uh, and shape ideas and policies based on contributions from uh, various stakeholders. Uh, that includes, of course, relevant experts, NGOs, the private sector, alongside the research and academia communities in the presence of the EU institutions. Uh, as a result, this multi-stakeholder platform of dialogue aims to look into solutions and opportunities, uh, addressing today's and tomorrow's environmental, but also socioeconomic challenges, such as ecosystem degradation, clean energy and transport, circular economy, biodiversity loss and climate change, but also growth and jobs. Uh, could we ever pull that off without science? No. So as the science policy nexus is uh, of significant meaning with regards to our work, I think we will all agree that it's perhaps now more important than ever. Uh, regarding the news, we noticed that uh, the United States uh, has officially joined the Paris Agreement under the Biden administration and also on our side of the Atlantic, the European Union has also found a provisional agreement on its first ever climate law. So uh, importantly enough, the EU climate law includes the creation of a European Scientific Advisory Board uh, to assess EU policy and monitor progress. So I sincerely think that the facts are there. Uh, those are just two examples from the news, underlining what I think could be summarized as uh, science's key role in policy making being uh, further strengthened. So as it should, if you're asking me, because no policy, uh, no well-informed, responsible policy could be established with a lack of its scientific component. Um, well, now at the same time, I cannot help but remember, I think it was a New Yorker cartoon, um, those lovely posts that come up high on your Instagram feed. And it showed the sketch of uh, Donald Trump and his vice president uh, isolated on a desert island with uh, water up to their necks, quoting, um, no worries, I'm tweeting that climate change is fake. Um, so on this note, well, here we are today, all those believers in uh, science for policy and also policy for science, I would like to add, uh, to explore more about uh, the EGU Science Policy Pairing Scheme, which is an annual activity coordinated by EGU to help promote a culture of evidence-informed policy making and stronger science policy partnerships. Uh, this session will also feature presentations from uh, Dr. Solmaz Mohajer and Ms. René Bichler, uh, who have previously participated in the pairing scheme, alongside as well uh, an interactive Q&A discussion with the audience. So please feel free to send us your questions in written via the chat box of the platform. Uh, once again, thank you very much for tuning in. If you have uh, connected just now, uh, we're about to start with the remarks of uh, Solmaz, who is an assistant professor at the University of Central Asia in Tajikistan, uh, though she is uh, currently based in Germany at the University of Tübingen and EGU Science Policy Pairing Scheme participant back in uh, 2019. Um, Solmaz is also research links uh, mountain building processes and erosion to geologic hazards, and also explores how scientific data can be translated into useful information for at-risk population and also to inform policy. Uh, in Teralia, she's also the founder of the Parks Quake Project, a global initiative that brings geohazard science and safety into school classrooms. So, uh, without further ado, Solmaz, uh, the floor is yours. So please take us through your work and uh, your experience as well of the scheme. Great, thank you, Elias. Um, you can see my slides, right? Uh, yes, very well. Okay, perfect. Yeah, um, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Thank you, Chloe, also for organizing this session and for inviting me to this panel discussion. And um, thank you, um, for, to the audience for being here. And um, I'm just gonna take a few moments to describe my experiences with the EGU Science Policy Pairing Scheme. So back in 2019, 
Um, I had the opportunity to actually be part of this pairing scheme. And um, what you're seeing here is basically me, the scientist, being paired um, with uh, a member of European Parliament from Finland, Miss uh, Mia Petra Kumpalanatri, uh, who is the policymaker. And um, I was invited to her office, and I had a few days in Brussels and at the European Parliament to shadow her and her team and learn a little bit more about the policymaking process. So what you're looking at here is me in, in her office and basically um, giving uh, some of my input on the topic of the impact of sea level rise and climate change on the coastal communities of the Baltic Sea region. Um, so this experience also uh, brought me uh, a number of other opportunities and um, I wrote a blog about this, so feel free to check out the link that's shown here at the very top um, to learn a bit more about the details of this experience. But some of the main activities that I was engaged in, um, obviously the very first one was to provide scientific input uh, to the member of a parliament and also her team. So again, this was on climate change and uh, the impact of it on the coastal communities of the Baltic Sea. And, um, and this was done through a presentation to her team, but also through an Q&A session, um, an interview session that I did with her um, that was, I think, uh, broadcasted live um, for population in Finland to, to check out. So this was really a great opportunity um, for, I think, the member of parliament to get an input of a scientist on some of the most crucial um, questions that the general public have um, regarding climate change. Um, but also it was a very, amazing opportunity for me to see how a scientist can actually be matched with a member of parliament and use uh, scientific information um, in, a, in a way that is actually meaningful for policy making process and also for the general public. Um, so in addition to being paired um, with uh, the member of parliament, I was also able to attend a couple of parliamentary events. And one of them was focused on, again, the Baltic Sea region um, and um, also the sustainable development goals, all the topics that I'm also particularly interested in. And the way these uh, parliamentary events were selected was that I discussed it with a member of parliament and she basically, uh, based on my interest, made a couple of recommendations and basically um, um, took me to some of the sessions that she was also um, facilitating on those uh, couple of days that I was with her. Um, but a very big part of this pairing scheme was the networking opportunity um, that happened both during my visit to the parliament, but also outside of um, the time that I spent in the parliament. Um, I was able to actually meet up with members uh, from the European Research uh, Committee, as well as um, the Emergency Response Coordination Center, um, who is also, which is also located in Brussels. And the latter, the Emergency Response Coordination Center, actually um, a lot of the work that they do, which includes responses to disasters, it's very close to my scientific research, which focuses on natural hazards. So I was able to meet um, many scientists as well as policymakers and practitioners that are working uh, in the field that I'm also doing research in. And so this was a really great networking opportunity as well for me. In terms of the top three lessons that I learned as part of the uh, pairing scheme, um, the very first lesson was um, to, to be ready to help and um, make the statement, but I'm not an expert, really your last resort. Um, and um, I guess it's kind of easy to say that, um, but uh, to be honest with you, when I was told to give um, input, scientific input on climate change impact on Baltic Sea region, um, I was very nervous. This is the topic that is not very closely related to the research that I do, uh, but I had to really remember that I am still a scientist and um, through all my trainings, I've been uh, basically working on developing skills for um, evaluating scientific information critically and also being able to communicate that with a much broader audience and using that skill as well as the network, um, including my colleagues um, at the university to really help me prepare um, how I was going to be useful really to the member of parliament on this very specific topic, even though I was not an expert. The second lesson that I learned is to really keep up the pace and um, be ready to work with very little information. So when I was asked to give my input on this very specific topic to the parliament, um, I, I, I had very little information to work with. 
um, I had exactly just the title of the topic and then I had to sort of figure out what are some of the most crucial information related to climate uh, change impact for the Baltic Sea region and, uh, and take it from there. So what I did was that I looked at the latest conference on this very specific topic, which happened um, to be a conference that took place in the same year, in 2019, specifically on topics related to climate change impact for Baltic Sea region, and really uh, browse through the abstracts, uh, all the scientific sessions, and select a couple of information that I thought were most crucial, also reaching out to some of the experts that presented at that conference and having their input um, before uh, preparing my presentation uh, at the parliament. And last but not least is um, the one lesson is to really, um, in order to capture you know, uh, the attention of policymakers, um, it's important to be able to tell a story or a good story. And everybody can connect to stories and policymakers are not excluded from that. And even if you don't have a story uh, or you're given a topic that you don't feel um, very close to or feel very, int uh, very um, intimate with, um, it's also okay to use someone else's story. So most of my, my research work actually takes place in Central Asia, very far from the Baltic Sea region. So I couldn't find that personal connection or a personal story with the Baltic Sea region. Um, but a friend of mine, a very good friend of mine actually is from the Baltic Sea region. So I had to really tap into some of his stories and experiences with the Baltic Sea to make um, my input a little bit more personal when talking to, um, to the team of um, this member of parliament. So those are the top three lessons that I learned. And, um, and I just want to take a moment and finish this uh, presentation with what followed next, because I also think that's really important. So the pairing scheme was um, really a good opportunity for me to gain a few skills um, and actually gave me the confidence to apply for other policy related um, activities. And to be honest with you, the pairing scheme was really the very first hands on um, policy related activity that I had done. So it really gave me the confidence and also it showed me that I am interested and I would like to um, go a little bit deeper into this field. So um, shortly following that, um, right before um, um, the pandemic in January, I was able to actually go to uh, Florence in Italy for a um, school called Evidence for Policy School, which focused on disaster risk management. Um, this school was organized by the European Commission's Joint Research Center, bringing um, many Europeans in the field of science policy and also practitioners um, to basically connect with one another and to learn how we can use scientific information, scientific data to inform policy. And uh, very recently, um, as recently as um, about a month ago, I joined the Voices for Science. This is an American Geophysical Union program. Um, it has two tracks, communication track and a policy track. I applied for the policy track, which is a 12 month program that um, uh, trains uh, scientists who are interested in uh, entering the uh, policy making process, uh, but also gives them a lot of opportunities to actually come in direct contact with um, American policymakers. And this year for the first time, um, Voices for Science opened uh, their selection of uh, people for this program to those based in Europe as well. And I hear that they're gonna continue doing that for the coming year. So maybe this is also another opportunity to look for. I have put my contact information here and I would be more than happy to get in touch with you or you get in touch with me. And um, if you have any questions later um, outside of this session, I would be more than happy to help you with that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Salmaz, for such an uh, interesting presentation of, uh, of your experience, which, uh, to be honest, sounds like an extremely interesting, but also highly recommended experience uh, for scientists uh, joining our session today. So uh, quite seamlessly, I'd like to transition to uh, our next speaker, uh, uh, Ms. René Bichler. I'm very happy to introduce you to Ms. Bichler, who holds uh, a bachelor degree in geography and a master's degree in cartography and geoinformation from the University of Vienna. In addition to her studies, Ms. Bichler also worked in the field of satellite-based land monitoring, completed an internship at ESA in Italy, and also a traineeship uh, at the JRC once again in Italy. Uh, Rene was also, uh, no, sorry, uh, Rene currently is working as a PhD student at the German Aerospace Center, BLR, 
in the field of air pollution monitoring from space, and further as a research assistant at the Department of Atmospheric Remote Sensing at the University of Augsburg. So I think it's an intervention we're all very much looking forward to. So uh, René, happy to hear more from you. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity and the nice introduction. Um, so yeah, I had a very different experience than Thomas. Um, my pairing scheme was um, a little bit short notice um, because of the Corona pandemic, more or less, and uh, we decided to make it a Vitra science policy pairing scheme. And I was part of um, Maria Spiraki and her team. And I just thought I could give you a little bit um, an overview of what Maria Spiraki is um, working on, which group she is um, a member of, and yeah, what were my tasks at the pairing scheme. So yeah, as um, I was introduced before. I have a bachelor degree in geography and a master in cartography and geoinformation. So I have no um, political or policy background, more or less. And I'm at the moment more focused on um, air pollution and um, how it um, relates with the economy and um, environmental health. But these are um, yeah, points that we we brief um, politicians in Germany about this topic. So it was a good the policy pairing scheme was a good um, opportunity for me to to get in touch with politicians. And Maria Spiraki is a group of the European People's Party, um, also known as APP or EPP, sorry. And um, she is a vice chair of the delegation for relations with the People's Republic of China. She is a member of the Committee on the Environment, Public Health and Food Safety, um, also the Committee on Industry, Research and Energy, and the Special Committee on Beating Cancer. Um, so her topics were very diverse, also my work. <laughs> we had in the virtual science policy pairing scheme three meetings, um, one with Maria Sparaki herself and two with her team, where we discussed different topics. I joined a committee meeting on um, beating cancer. Um, I was also part or involved in a session hosted by Maria Sparaki herself about the sustainable mobility and powering the action of climate change. Um, then I joined plenary sessions um, on the EU global strategy on COVID-19 vaccinations and other plenary sessions about different topics. And I also um, read through an, um, yeah, a research that was um, requested by the ENVI um, committee about air pollution and COVID-19. So the team was really trying to also put my research background um, a little bit in, in the pairing scheme. And another thing was that we received uh, questions from journalists. They were quite difficult to answer for me, to be honest. Um, and yeah, I think what was very interesting is how diverse um, the topics are that they work on. So one day we had a topic about cancer and the next day we talked about um, electric vehicles and batteries and um, the important role of hydrogen and on the next day we talked about the COVID-19 problems. So um, a lot of things where I don't really have background and as Thomas already said before, um, it's yeah, you have to deal with topics where you don't know so much about it and you have to be able to find um, answers or try to find answers in a very short time. But um, keep in mind that you'll be part of a team, you're not alone and you can ask people and they are very helpful and the team itself was super nice. And yeah, so this was everything from my experience from this virtual uh, science policy pairing scheme. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Renee. It's, uh, it's very interesting to see that uh, you had uh, an equally great opportunity uh, regardless of the current situation of the pandemic and the impact of COVID. And I would say also a very relevant experience with regards to your background and research work as well. Um, so um, at this stage, I would like to well let you know that uh, while organizers would be delighted to welcome uh, also the participating MEPs offices live feedback as well via their participation to today's session, unfortunately, uh, due to agenda limitations, we couldn't secure the participation of colleagues uh, I have to say that this is a very busy plenary week in the European Parliament, 
but I'm very positive that uh, we'll be even more successful next year. So uh, meanwhile, following bilateral discussions with uh, both offices, uh, MEP Kumpula Natris, but also MEP Maria Spiraki's offices, I'm very happy to extend their kind feedback and uh, their positive as well as highly valuable experience from the, from the scheme. So um, perhaps on this note, uh, we can kickstart our short panel session for today with uh, Solmaz and René, uh, starting perhaps with uh, Solmaz. And uh, I do have some questions, but just uh, as I see that Chloe has sent a message to the, to the chat box, I would also like to invite our audience as well to send us your questions uh, via the platform. So we can also pick some from there and address to, uh, to our set of speakers for today. So um, Solmaz, um, I know that it's been uh, around perhaps two years uh, since we, we met in person with Chloe as well at the Brussels office of the European Parliament Intergroup. And I think it was then uh, that you met also with the MEP. And um, could you please describe us a day with, uh, within the pairing scheme? What a day looks like? Yeah, gosh. Um, so from what I remember is that, um, yeah, you show up um, at the entrance of the parliament and uh, a member of her team, um, showed up and basically took me around, gave me a very brief tour of the place and sort of getting me familiar with, you know, where some of the most important things are and then going directly um, to the MEP's office, uh, being introduced there to everyone in the office. Um, but I mean, as, as you know, policymakers are, they have to be in so many sessions and oftentimes they're running from one session to another. Um, sometimes the session even is not finished, you know, they, they come and give their, um, their, you know, their, their two cents or their presentation and then they have to run to another session. Um, so the, the very first day I remember that I was just really running around <laughs> um, from one session to another and really being amazed um, how difficult yet um, exciting this kind of um, this kind of job is for a policymaker, of course, being from the outside and looking at it, you know, from the outside, um, that yes, you need to be in different places and you have different roles. Sometimes a policymaker is presenting, you know, at a session, sometimes they're attending. Um, and, um, and during those times, maybe they have a brief moment in their office and then, you know, you're scheduled perhaps at, at, at one of these brief moments, I was scheduled, you know, to talk to the member of parliament and giving my input. But um, a day in the parliament, yeah, what I remember just going from one session to another and also fe feeling really privileged to be in, in, some, se in some sessions that um, when you see policymaking taking place live, you know, we often look at the news and, you know, we listen to the radio and most of the time we hear the result of a decision. Um, or that maybe a decision is being discussed, but being able to sit in a session and see people how they vote or how much time they have or opportunities they have to stand up and um, share their voice on many different topics. So one of the sessions was a foreign affairs session and that was really interesting for me to see how um, the floor is actually given to uh, many of the participants to basically share their concerns and how those concerns actually are taken into account to form a policy or an action that will be introduced later. So um, being able to see that live was certainly a very good experience for me. Thank you very much, uh, Solmaz, for, for highlighting that. And uh, specifically, it's uh, from a personal point of view as well, a very fascinating experience to be part of all those processes, the decision-making process in EU institutions. And I would say in Brussels overall to see uh, how, um, how decisions are actually being shaped before the news become the news. Um, so um, just uh, on this note, I'd like to turn to René. Uh, who was participating in the pairing scheme uh, earlier this year. Uh, I know that this year's version was uh, impacted by COVID, uh, yet EGU managed to put together an excellent organization. So, uh, René, how would you comment perhaps on the challenges and opportunities of the pandemic to the pairing scheme? I know that perhaps uh, due to COVID, uh, the timeline of this opportunity was extended to more than a week, as I guess was the case for uh, Solmaz, but uh, happy to, to hear more from you from uh, an insider's point of view. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, um, the, the pairing scheme was uh, for around two weeks. Um, one problem that we faced um, when we coordinated the pairing scheme was that I have a full time job and it was a little bit short notice, so I couldn't um, take, I had to work normally with my 40 hours a week and try to um, yeah, do the pairing scheme as well. So this was a little bit um, troubling also, but the team were super nice and we um, had our meetings and we tried to set up um, sessions that I could join or um, they explained me also where I can find um, the plenary sessions or the committee meetings where um, Maria Sparaki was joining it or when she hosted a meeting by herself. Um, how to do that so it was it was they were very nice and everything was uh, yeah we, we tried to to make it um, happen um what else um so normally we had our meetings around noon um we all were in our home office some of the team were in greece some were in, in um, brussels um and yeah then we talked about which session I could join. I joined the session and I listened to it and we talked about it a little bit. And um, yeah, more or less that was it from the virtual part. But this was also because I had I have my job as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your feedback, Rene. Uh, I just noticed that we do have received a question from the Q&A's box. Uh, I'll just read it out loud. It says, I might have missed it during the presentation, but can you choose the MEP you'll be working with during a pairing scheme? So uh, on this note, perhaps uh, I can reply to part of the question and then I'll leave it to Chloe for the, for the end of the session to just also provide you some further information regarding the pairing scheme in the future and uh, how we plan to move forward for uh, uh, the remaining part of the year and then looking ahead for 2022. So uh, just on this note, I'll, um, I'll take my moderator hat off and I'll reply as uh, EP Intergroup Secretariat. So um, indeed, uh, the MEP's uh, selection, it, uh, it's very much linked to MEP's agendas and uh, availabilities. Uh, so um, with regards to, um, to those two uh, pairing schemes we hosted back in uh, 2019 and beginning of the year, uh, we opted for the two co-chairs of the European Parliament Intergroup, uh, Ms. Kumpula Natri that uh, Solma has paired with uh, is a member of SND, the Socialist and Democrats political group in the European Parliament, an MEP from Finland. And with regards to this year's uh, scheme, uh, Rene had the opportunity to work with MEP Ms. Maria Spiraki coming from uh, EPP and Greece. So uh, different uh, political groups, uh, different, uh, different regions as well of Europe. So I hope uh, this was also diverse with regards to the, to the opportunities uh, addressed. Um, Another question, perhaps, um, to both Solmaz and René. Um, I'd be very interested in, um, in learning what was actually the most fascinating, the most uh, interesting part of the, of the experience, uh, looking back. Um, yeah, shall I start? OK. Um, the most interesting part was how diverse their work was, um, because as a scientist, I'm really focused on one topic and try to be a specialist in this one thing and to understand everything. And then I had to deal every day with something different and to understand or realize that I don't have so much knowledge as I thought I have and that um, the questions that we received from a journalist, for example, were quite difficult to answer. It was specifically about the European Green Deal and how it impacts the um, economic um, yeah, in, in Greece. And I do a little bit of economy in my research, but this was a very detailed questions and took quite a long time to, to understand that. And um, so I was, I was very surprised how, how much how much knowledge they must gain in a very short time and how stressful it can be. And yeah, I think this was, I, I was not expecting it. And what I learned from it was that from a scientist's perspective, I will understand or have, keep in mind that when I have to prepare my work or, pre or present my work to them, that this is not the only thing that they have to deal with and how I present my information and yeah, understand a little bit better what they have to, yeah, to work with. Thank you very much, Renee. And I think this is also very much linked at the same time with the two uh, lessons learned, the key 
uh, takeaway messages of Solmaz within the EGU blog post as well, because Solmaz was mentioning uh, there should be a lack of hesitation from the scientist's point of view. I have noted here uh, your message as be ready to help, but also keep up uh, the pace with the European Parliament and how it functions. So, Rene, would you like to perhaps uh, further comment on uh, your most interesting part of the experience? Um, yeah, so what I really liked is when they also tried to um, put my research background um, into, into their work so that I could a little bit more um, have a conversation with them or bring my input. Um, that was something that I uh, really appreciated. And um, what I also liked is when I had troubles with um, answering the questions, um, at some point I I sent them an email and I said, this is quite difficult to answer and I think I cannot manage this in time. And they just were very nice and said, it's okay, we didn't expect you to answer all these questions, just give it a shot and we just wanted to let you know what we are working with. So, um, yeah, I, I don't, I, I didn't have the pressure to really um, bring some important input as Solmes did. So I had not the, the pressure to give a briefing or something. Yeah. So open communication as well, I think comes as a key takeaway message as well uh, from scientists, uh, well, two scientists uh, who want to be involved in policy making. Uh, Solmaz, anything else to add? Um, just, yeah, one, one thing which resonates a lot with what Renee said that um, it's, it's really a learning experience and maybe one should also look at it as a learning experience. So in, in this context, um, you know, with the climate change uh, topic and the questions that I had received, I remember that I um, had a couple of coffee sessions with a colleague of mine um, next door who is a climate scientist. And I basically asked him to sit down with me and help me understand some of the reports that were highlighted by other research scientists on the Baltic Sea region. And um, there were plots and figures there that I couldn't completely understand. And I wanted to make sure that I understand them well enough that I can translate it in a meaningful way um, to a policymaker. And uh, so this was this, this brought me closer to my own scientific you know, community, network of scientists, scientists that are near me. Um, and um, basically, even with the uh, interview questions that I were asked to do um, at the European Parliament, I remember some of the interview questions were really difficult. Um, so for instance, one question was, um, because this interview was being broadcasted in Finland, um, one question was, many Finnish people may say that, well, you know, climate warming or uh, climate change is actually quite nice because we get sunnier days, you know, uh, the temperatures are better, um, we have longer summers perhaps. Um, what is your message as a scientist to people who think like that? And it may seem like a very easy um, question to answer, but in fact it was very difficult because you have to also be very sensitive of the community that comes up with that question. Um, you don't want to alienate them, but you also want to make sure that um, the latest scientific information is shared in the most meaningful way. And even for a question like that, I remember I had to pick up the phone um, maybe a couple of hours before the interview and get my colleague back on the phone again and says, look, this is my answer. You know, is this sensitive enough? Is this good enough? Um, so I guess the learning experience was that, yes, um, expect that. You're, you're going to learn a lot. But um, as I think one of you mentioned that this is, um, you're not alone. You have your colleagues, you have the scientists, even, the, even those scientists may not be your colleagues next door. Um, even the EGU community, you can reach out to the EGU community. And um, I have never really, I've hardly written an email to a scientist um, and never getting a respond from them. You will get some form of respond one way or another, um, at least from most scientists. So um, I think as a scientist getting into policy making, you should remember that you have this army of people behind you that um, most of the time they're ready to help you. And uh, Solmaz, I just noticed that we have received another question in the Q&A's box and that's, uh, were you at any point afraid of making mistakes? Yes, all the time. <laughs> so I was afraid of making mistakes. 
Um, but that fear was not so much that it wouldn't, that it would paralyze me. It would make me nervous. So honestly, I was not 100% comfortable about this. Um, first, it was my first science policy experience. And second, it was a topic, a scientific topic that I was not very familiar with. So being nervous and also being a little bit afraid of making mistakes is totally natural. Um, and so that's part of the process. But again, you have to remember that what you can do to manage that fear. And for me, one way to manage it is to inform myself and inform myself rather quickly. So that's why I reached out to the very first person, the closest person I could reach out to. And as I was talking to my colleague, I was also trying to reach out to other scientists that know more than I do about this particular region. And also telling those scientists that, look, I am, I've been put into this situation where I've been asked to give my two cents on this particular topic uh, with policymakers. And I want to know what is the most important scientific discovery that you think is so relevant to the um, coastal communities of the Baltic Sea region. And then I, what they tell me, I would translate that. So I was kind of like this bridge between the climatologists uh, working in this region and the policymakers who are interested um, in solving um, societal problems. So if I could try to sum up your, uh, your reply, Solmaz, that would be that uh, fear indeed existed, but it didn't act as a bottleneck, but rather as an uh, enabling factor, a motivating factor. That's a very inspiring message. Um, René, any uh, points of views on the same question as well? Uh, yeah, I had. Uh, I was afraid too when I first read the questions from the journalists. So I, I was overwhelmed and uh, couldn't answer them. And I think I also got a little bit lost in the details um, to answer questions and to find scientific um, publications about it to prove my answer and yeah, why I came to this conclusion. And at some point I, I realized, okay, this is not working. I should step a, a little bit, yeah, one step back and have a, keep the big picture in mind and write down some, some bullet points. And um, I also communicated it with um, the team that um, what my troubles were and um, that I tried to, um, yeah, answer the questions. And I also got in touch with um, colleagues from my period, yeah, from my past experiences at the JRC, for example, and asked the colleagues there who work a little bit more with policy makers and um, this kind of things. But yes, I was afraid to make mistakes with my answers. Um, but the team will read through your um, things that you provide to them and they will make the final decision what to do with it. So just give it a shot. So with regards to lessons learned, I have mapped uh, um, Solmaz's key messages uh, summed up as be ready to help, uh, keep up the pace. Remember the positive uh, value of storytelling as well. Uh, Solmaz, that was mentioned within your uh, EGU blog post as well but also some key takeaways of today's discussion. It's quite important as well to have open communication with the policymakers. I would also add to invest on uh, building an open communication channel uh, with policymakers. I was just, um, uh, interesting enough, I was uh, reading an article the other day about uh, the evaluation of the possible means of interacting with uh, politicians uh, in the, well, uh, post uh, COVID times now. So. Uh, picking up the phone was, uh, as you perhaps uh, would expect, uh, the first choice, the most prominent choice, the most impactful uh, option uh, for uh, scientists who want to be involved with policymakers. And then you also had, of course, uh, sending emails, inviting to events. I think also those are very worthy opportunities to explore and uh, perhaps uh, uh, some input for uh, scientists uh, joining us today to keep in mind. Uh, I have also noted uh, what uh, René mentioned as well as uh, having quickly some plan Bs uh, in place in case plan A doesn't work. And then uh, as uh, Solmaj underlined as well to also activate your network of scientists or fellow scientists because it's uh, very fascinating to see that uh, actually the whole community is united. And Solmaz, uh, in the case of the pairing scheme back in 2019, you uh, very well mentioned that uh, you were able to reach out to your uh, community, to fellow scientists, uh, to also kindly assist you with regards to some of the tasks. Um, so uh, prior to uh, wrapping up, 
Uh, maybe we can take one or two more questions. Uh, is there any other, other advice, uh, Solmaz and René, perhaps to the ones that we've already mentioned that you'd like to add uh, and provide scientists with uh, for new scientists who want to engage with uh, policymakers? Anything else perhaps that we've left uh, unaddressed? Maybe something really basic, but I think for the participants who are in this session, you're doing the right thing just by being in this session because you are already connecting yourself with a number of people who are working at the science policy interface. And we automatically become part of that network of people that you could later rely on or tap into. Um, the, the reason I got really interested in the pairing scheme, it, was, it wasn't that it came out of nowhere that suddenly I realized that this is something I wanna apply for, but actually over several years of attending um, EGU policy sessions, um, I started to slowly discover that this is a field that I'm interested in and I can pick up skills along the way that would prepare me one day for actually coming into contact directly with a policymaker and be able to provide my input. So for me, it was actually a long process of several years of coming to EGU and I was always attending, you know, the scientific sessions, but I slowly also started adding sessions that are not in my division and are not really considered you know, scientific session. And through these sessions, I discovered my joy for doing or getting involved with science policy making, uh, but also gaining some basic skills um, so that when it come to um, applying for the pairing scheme, I knew for sure that I really wanted to do this if, I had, if, I, if I'm given the opportunity. And then after that, you just continue doing um, maybe other activities that takes you to a different level. And, um, and at any point you may discover that this is not something that you want to do, but at least you tried it and you know. Um, so I guess my, um, my advice would be, if you think you are interested in science policy, which I think you are, um, just give it a try, attend a couple of more sessions, um, look for opportunities you can get involved in, build your network and um, really discover for yourself if this is something you want to do. Um, before trying to go a little bit deeper into it. So if I, if I can attempt to sum up once again your uh, key messages, Olmaz, this is about the uh, pairing scheme being a highly valued, strongly recommended, and from my point of view, from, uh, from the AP Intergroup Secretariat point of view, uh, happy to also hereby confirm very impactful uh, opportunity as well uh, from the policymakers point of view. Uh, René, uh, turning to you, any key takeaway messages as well from your side? Yeah, maybe if you want to prepare a little bit, um, there are also some online courses that you can join, which, um, yeah, where you can get a little bit of an insight and get familiar with the international policy system. Or um, Chloe also sent me the Science for Policy Handbook, for example, it's a PDF, it's online. So if you're interested and you feel you want to inform yourself a little bit before you can read through the document it's very well structured and written um and yeah i think somas mentioned everything and yeah the plenary sessions um from the eu parliament are publicly available so you can go on the website and have a look on it and um, join some sessions and um, you can also do some research on the member of the parliaments and what committees are they are um, a member of and um, inform yourself a little bit about it so um, if you want to prepare yourself a little bit that yeah thank you very much uh, Rene for highlighting that uh, I'll just quickly add my email address as well to the chat box for uh, uh, interested uh, attendees as well to kindly reach out, although I understand that Chloe is the most relevant person with regards to the science policy pairing scheme on behalf of EGU. Uh, I'm adding quickly my email to the chat box here and I think perhaps uh, we can wrap up today's session as well. Uh, I think it's fair to say that um, we have unanimously come to agree on the need to bring uh, scientific expertise and knowledge from uh, different disciplinary areas to ongoing policy making initiatives and processes. Uh, to support well informed decisions by policy and I honestly believe that this is something we just cannot afford to miss at this stage we need uh, strong science for policy policymakers need your valuable input and they need it now more than ever uh, in the end the science policy nexus will not work unless we invest all of our energy in making it and I'm very happy that uh, Solmaz, Rene and Chloe are so successful in doing so um, when it comes to also tips on how to best engage with policymakers 
tips for scientists involved in policy making. I couldn't agree more with our set of speakers of today. Perhaps another point worth uh, uh, stressing is to try to build an open communication channel and deep engagement with policymakers, uh, taking advantage of uh, every opportunity out there. And I think this is where the great success of the science policy pairing scheme lies. So once again, thank you very much for joining us today. A big thanks to Solmaz and Rene, but also to Chloe and the EGU community for the outstanding organization. Uh, it's been a real pleasure having this event with you today. Uh, so I really hope to see you again next year. Um, on this note, very happy to provide the floor back to Chloe for her uh, wrap up of today's sessions, as I also think there's some important info that uh, Chloe has to share. Sure, thank you so much, Elias. And I, I must say, like this pairing scheme also wouldn't happen without your help. So before we do close the session today, I just want to give some, some information about the next pairing scheme, which will hopefully happen towards the end of this year. So this pairing scheme has only happened twice so far. It's happened both with Solmez and Renee, and we're hoping to have it a third time this year. Um, the entire time it's happened, it has been a learning experience for us at the EGU as well. So, I mean, obviously this year was very a very different situation with Renee, um, and she did a fantastic job at jumping in relatively last minute, as she mentioned, um, and also experiencing that sort of online pairing to see how that went. And of course, this brings its own challenges, as Renee mentioned, Mentioned, you know, she wasn't able to stop working for two weeks to partake in the pairing scheme. Um, so we are really hoping to be able to do this later this year so that it can be in person in the parliament once again. Um, and for this reason, we haven't started the process of the pairing yet. I mean, going back to the earlier question of how do we pick the MEPs? So as Ilias mentioned, both MEPs are actually co-chairs of his into group um, and that's sort of where the initial selection came came from but there's a lot of MEPs that are actually involved with the intergroup um, and a lot of these MEPs are part of the intergroup for one reason is that they really appreciate science um, so it makes it quite an easy selection and and we do go through these these MEPs and I will go through these MEPs again this year and sort of you know, pick a top 10 and work with Ilias on that as well um, to make sure we get an MEP that is that is a good fit so um, before we we release the parents Scheme before we advertise it online, we will actually contact this MEP and select the MEP um, so that we can put them alongside the advertisement we make so you know who you will be paired with if you're selected. Um, and the MEP also helps with the selection of the scientist as well. So it's a very um, involved, integrated system that we've created um, that I actually think works quite well. So if you are interested in getting more information about this pairing scheme as it progresses, I assume, again, it's very difficult to know with COVID, but I assume it will happen around November this year. Let's keep our fingers crossed. Um, do keep an eye out for that. You can also join the EGU's database of expertise. And if you join this database, you'll actually receive a monthly newsletter from me. And that'll have not only things like the pairing scheme in it, but it will also have things, um, different science and policy opportunities that you might like to get involved with, different online sessions, or as Renee said, different um, trainings that you can attend um, that aren't necessarily from the EGU, but from other institutions as well. So just all the opportunities Opportunities that are out there that exist for scientists to engage that I think might be interesting for our members. Um, so I do recommend you, you join that to get the updates. I'll also obviously be advertising it through the EGU website as well. And again, probably around November. So we'll have to see how COVID goes, but that would be the hope. Um, but other than that, I would really, really like to thank Ilias for um, moderating this whole session and introducing the pairing scheme so nicely. And of course, Solmaz and Renee as well. So that's all from me. I'll hand back over to um, Ilias for any final words, I guess. Well, I couldn't, uh, <laughs> I couldn't sum up the discussion in a, in a better fashion. I'm also on behalf of the Secretariat of the Intergroup very much looking forward to building on this collaboration and seeing uh, what we can best achieve uh, jointly in, uh, with regards to the pairing scheme for uh, 2021 for later in the year and then also for 2022 uh, onwards. I guess that's a lot of um, a lot of this uh, materialization is very much linked with uh, situations that's out of our hands. So we're doing our best to adapt with COVID, the situation there, and very happy that uh, for this year as well, EGU was uh, so successful in uh, providing this opportunity to scientists. So uh, on this note, very happy to continue working on the science policy nexus. It's been among the key priorities of this intergroup since its first establishment in 1994. So it's uh, honestly a great pleasure to be working with uh, Chloe, Solmaz, and Rene. 
and more scientists now looking ahead.